So friends, I'm again here. My name is Tanvi Rajse and in this called Postmodernism and Visual Arts, we are going to look at the idea of postmodern and how it reflected in the works of art created by the artists from 1960s onwards. But before going into the before going into the debate what consists of postmodernism or to say what do we mean by postmodernism or to put it more succinctly and simply what defines postmodern what does it entail to be a postmodern work of art what does it mean to be living in postmodernism what does it ultimately mean when an artist who works and calls it a postmodern work of art but to flag off a disclaimer in the beginning it will be worthwhile to notify you that postmodernism is an extremely complex area because it's all over the place it's happening across arts it's happening across literature it's happening across philosophy so there's no limited definition for the first uh, <clears throat> there's no limited definition of postmodernism as such and the definitions that we have encountered or we will encounter in this lecture the definitions that have been set forth by the philosophers by the theoreticians by the writers by the literary critics by the visual artists are all together able to form a web of interpretations so this is the premise from where i will begin that to come to a concrete and yet coherent definition of postmodernism is almost impossible as i said postmodernism is against the narrative of linearity it doesn't believe in one narrative it doesn't believe in one thought it doesn't believe in one single concept of a thing for example if we say god postmodernists will ask you which god are you referring to what is the idea of god here what are the definitions of god here what is the history of the idea of god here? in different cultures in different conditions in different environments as well as in different contexts obviously postmodernism means different things as i said previously it is impossible to arrive at a concrete a proper definition of postmodernism and say hey this is it but what we'll try to understand in this lesson are the contours that shaped up the idea of postmodernism and you will see me borrowing examples from literature from critical theory from philosophy from visual arts to arrive at a point where these threads could be connected with the help of obviously examples from visual art because that is the thing we have to concentrate here on let me first start with you must have i'm sure learned about the idea of modernism and uh, what it means to be modern how does one proclaim to be living in a modern area or how does one think about what comes in our minds what does our imagination see or what is our perception form when we talk about a modernist painting or a modernist sculpture i'm sure you must have learned about that but to just do a back and forth i will go back to the idea of the term modern because like romantic the term romance the term romantic the two terms which are ambiguous after romantic after romanticism that we must have learned about the two terms which stand apart or at the same time the two terms which are more complex to define because too much has been said about them too much has been a, a lot of work has been done on them on the areas known as modernism and postmodernism now without wasting much time let's come to the etymology or the history of the genealogy or the inception or the beginning or the invention of the word modern first which will help us but the architect by the name of Howard Sugar set himself 
the task of reconstructing the church of St. Denis, which had fallen into a decay. This architect, instead of going by the conventions, instead of abiding the conventions of the architectural design, instead of falling back on the tradition which was in vogue, the prevalent tradition of the times of Romanesque, which was Greco-Roman architecture alongside the Romanesque idiom of architecture, came up with a building. Remember, it's a building that is being re renovated. The structure is already there, so he's experimenting with the shape, experimenting with the form, experimenting with the way a building has been constructed. But when it was about to be inaugurated, he found that it is a different building. It neither resembles Greek architecture nor resembles Roman architecture, and neither is it falling under the purview, falling within the purview of the architectural design or architectural discourse in vogue during 1127. Not knowing to term it, not knowing how to compartmentalize it, not knowing how to fit it within the confines of the, the you know, given architectural definitions, not knowing how to place it within the notions of architecture, within the notions of design of the time, he fell back on Latin language and called it Opus Modern. The Opus Modern, the Latin term, means a modern work. Now, what does he mean by the modern work? Here, the complexity is that it is, remember that I said that it is not resembling with the idea of what Greek architecture is. It's neither reflecting the idea of what Romanesque architecture is, nor is it coming very close to the idea of what Roman architecture was about. It's somewhere in the middle, at the same time, nowhere. So he called it a work of now, a work of present which is happening now. That's what modernism stands for. Now, what happens then when postmodern comes into being? Or, to put it more clearly, when does it happen? Or, when did it happen? What actually led us? Where do we begin to discuss the idea of postmodernism? Well, there are, there are multiple interpretations of this. There are theoretical considerations, there are antitheses, there are theses, there are critical approaches, there are agreements, there are disagreements. From, for some philosophers, for some theoreticians, postmodernism is nothing, but for many, it is something. Postmodernism is an attitude of life. Now, to arrive, to start from the beginning, as I said, it believes in multiple narratives. What are those narratives? What do we mean by multiple narratives? Now, where do we start when we mean narrative? That's what postmodernism is all about. So let's start with, uh, as I said, the modernism. Let's start with the idea of modernism. I'm just trying to do a back and forth in order to bring home a proper understanding, if not an absolute understanding of the word postmodernism. So what do we mean by modernism? Or how do we arrive at a proper definition of modernism? What does it entail to be modern? Where do we start with? Or where do we start from? What do we start with? What are the parameters that one can put in place to scrutinize the things to deem them modern or non-modern? Let's see, loosely, you know, if we define the canon, because as I said, these are the most ambiguous terms. So whatever I am saying is not absolute. You can go and look into the books and find something very different from what has been said in this lecture, what you have heard about it. But the interesting thing is that the modernism is a blanket term. It's an umbrella in your hands under which you can incorporate a huge variety of cultural and artistic practices that shaped up after 18th century. Now, why is 18th century so crucial here? Why am I mentioning this date? Let me tell you. In the age of enlightenment, the philosophers and the thinkers of the century believed that one could arrive at a, at a point where, that by using science, reason and logic, 
we could get rid of the religious discourse we could get rid of the religious mythology which has which had riddled the idea of progress the idea of reason the idea of logic because it had a, a religious a religious discourse did not allow us to think beyond god beyond the absolute and this absolute was becoming absolute for everybody else doesn't matter whether they could make sense of it or not the important aspect of after the enlightenment in 19th century one of the reasons that became crucial to the modernism was the idea of progress now what was this progress about modernism as i said is a blanket term that covers a range of cultural practices a range of ideas and it didn't as as we see that these ideas didn't occur in people's mind overnight there are gaps between ideas of years of decades sometimes of a century but how does one come to a consensus that what did modernism propose how was it against the idea of enlightenment how was it against the idea of religion how was it against the idea of absolutism that god is this and god is that what do they mean when they talk about modernity which is another part of modernism where it is related with the technology the science and the innovation that shaped up human life after 19th century so to sum it up modernism the definition perhaps we should go to poetry as i said that i'll be running here and there bringing together threads and definitions from various fields to arrive at a point where we could think of the ideas further about the ideas that shaped up the idea of modernism and postmodernism so things fall apart the center cannot hold mere anarchy is loosed upon the world what are the things that uh, that yeats is referring to that couldn't stand the ground couldn't hold the ground and fell apart yeats here is telling us about the universal values that was that were set forth by the idea of, by the advent of enlightenment rather yeats is referring to the ideas that were set forth by the thinkers of enlightenment about logic being absolute that it applies to you me and everybody else under the sky the idea of reason that there's a reason behind everything there's a reason between uh, behind uh, uh, my existence and your existence that there's a notion called progress that man the human life uh, progresses from point a to point b for yet they didn't met they didn't uh, for they didn't uh, stand the ground they fell apart and towards humanity would thus you know the things that fell apart in the modern era were the things that were set forth by the 18th century enlightenment which essentially talked about science reason and logic with these three or four things the thinkers believed that we can get rid of religious superstition mythology about the absolutism of the god about the narratives that church essentially or the religion essentially had propagated about the existence of the man about the existence of the god about humanity would they walk towards a state of freedom happiness and progress thinkers were propagated thinkers who propagated the idea of modernism included the infamous karl marx a german philosopher edmund burke marcus de sade and max weber so what did they believe let's highlight some key issues let's highlight some key points they believed and key ideas they proposed in front of the humanity to have the idea of that how religious values how superstition how mythology uh, how the misery which has been propagated that it is because of the sins doesn't stand any ground karl marx the first philosopher he believed in progress he imagined a utopia a vision that saw a perfect world as an outcome of the materialist science explanations explanations of history dialectical dialectical materialism which sees historical progress as the political struggle between two classes resulting in a new socio-economic order so karl marx here is talking about the society which has been classified into classes rich poor and the elite where the power structure 
is put in place so that the rich remains rich, the poor remains poor. The idea of progress, which is there in the is the is the part and parcel of modernism, speaks essentially from the perspective of Karl Marx's theory. Francis Bacon he saw progress taking the uh, he saw progress taking the form of knowledge with the wise, ethical, and science-minded elite would be the custodians of knowledge. Edmund Burke, Burke was disgusted with the excess of the French Revolution. Marcus de Sade, he explored the perversities of sexual freedom, painting a dark picture of human liberation. Max Weber, another thinker, he prophesied that the future would be an iron prison of reason and bureaucracy. Now, these are the thinkers who sort of paved the way for modernism to emerge, paved the way for ideas that could be incorporated. That world is not only your and mine, it belongs to someone else as well. The world is not about living and letting people live, but it's also about the fundamental rights. It's also about the right to, uh, right to live, right to earn, right to be. But in modern art, what we see, which uh, a dance in Impressionism, as some of the uh, theoreticians will tell you about. But the first painting that Manet did, as we pinpoint that the modernism starts from Renaissance, and then we come to Impressionism, that modernism starts from Impressionistic painting. So, what does that mean? How does it? How does it? How does it correlate to each other? What happened in the Impressionism that had that people had not seen before? Of course, you know, the theories that have been proposed by these thinkers, they were not proposed before. There were ideas that were new, but what was there in Impressionism that was very new? I'm sure you must have heard about it in your previous lectures, you must have learned enough about it. So I'm not going to touch upon every detail of Impressionism, but just giving you a snapshot of how people saw art differently. Now, when we go back to the uh, the Eurocentric notions of art to the Eurocentric notions of progress, we have to understand the Winkelmannian parabolic order, which talks about Winkelmann is an art historian. He was from Germany. Uh, he started the discipline of art history after Vasari. So what he did is that he gave this idea of parabole, the parabole, the semicircle, and he pinpointed that the parabolic order is its a society starts from here, say point A. On point B of the parabole, which is the horizon of the parabole, what happens there is that it, it shows the progress. So the society has reached to a culmination point of the progress. The society has developed to a considerable extent or to every extent, it has reached to the limits of progress. Now what happens after that? He says that after that it declines. So according to these narratives, European art history has been constructed in a way that you see a beginning of a movement, say for example Renaissance, and then you see the peak of Renaissance, early Renaissance, high Renaissance, and then the end of the Renaissance, and then it jumps to the mannerism. Right, and you see the emergence of mannerism as a, you know, from the paintings of El Greco and others, and then you see the peak of mannerism before it, uh, you know, plunges into uh, Baroque. Now, what happens here is that the idea of history was a single narrative. It's a linear narrative that has been constructed, and art history for a long time followed this narrative. Now, impression is what they believed in that after Renaissance, when the Renaissance ended, a new idiom, a new visual appearance in front of the human eye came into being, which reached to a point of zenith, which reached to a point of horizon, then it had a collapse, it had a downfall. Now, what happened after that? A new movement began. A new movement began, and what happened to that new movement? It also had the same fate. It started, it came to a point where it was in absolute fusion, and then it had a downfall, it collapsed down. To give birth to another moment, that happened with the European perspective. That happened with the European idea of progress, when Impressionism, the Mane, the infamous uh, Mane, uh, first painted the luncheon on the grass. You must have seen it in the Impressionism. What happened there that Mane, instead of abiding by the terms and conditions laid out, the pictorial terms and conditions laid down 
by the four fathers who painted during the time of renaissance and afterwards he completely disagreed with them in a manner that for the first time in the history of painting he put a nude a nude nude figure if you see in the in the painting of lantern in the grass that he put a nude figure in a public spot the lantern in the grass where you see the two men and the nude picture and the woman behind and also there was something very serious about his treatment when he painted the picture of emily zola while previously he disagreed with the renaissance and put a nude figure out at the public spot it was a picnic luncheon on the grass in a park public park two men are dressed the women is not dressed now secondly what he did while he painting the uh, picture of emily zola if you see in the trousers of zola the trousers are painted crudely they are not painted as per the guidelines prescribed by the renaissance painters who believed in super fine details of each and everything that a painting depicts it was a break away from the tradition but after that what impressionism did was more radical that they completely broke off from the european traditional painting and went out of the studios and just to mention that european painting until impressionism was confined to the studios the artists would rarely we don't have accounts of artists who would paint the pictures outside in the field on the spot a painting a landscape so here the impressionists first broke away with the tradition dispensed with the rules of painting dispensed with the rules of representation dispense with the idea of perspective where you could see in the renaissance painting in other paintings of realism in baroque in neoclassicism in mannerism the perspective was very much concern a big concern for the artist to abide by a big concern for the artist to keep in mind while depicting a human figure whether in a foreshortening pose or in the background so accordingly if you depict a picture which is in the front it will be bigger than the picture that you depict in the background but what happened here that they destroyed the idea of perspective they destroyed the idea of indoors they destroyed the idea of indoor painting the studio of pays the studio painting they went on to depict the nature in its all representations in its all moods in all fleeting aspects as you must have seen in the impressionism in ways that they could achieve the fleeting light if it's a morning time it should reflect so morning time lasts for one hour so they have to capture the fleeting light of the morning the mood of the morning if it's a cloudy day if it's a cloudy morning if it's a cloudy evening so the nature has the changing moods of the nature then we come to the post impressionism what they did is they did continue in the impressionistic style but gave prominence to the feeling the intuition the emotion then we come to uh, later moments until we come to picasso picasso what he did is something more radical in his cubistic painting as we know that the picasso is the most famous name in the world of art what he did in his cubist paintings was that instead of looking at you instead of looking at me uh, from one perspective instead of looking at a tree from one perspective instead of looking at a pot instead of looking at an object from one sp- one perspective he looked at it from multiple perspectives and brought those multiple perspectives together on the canvas creating a juxtaposition of forms that initially distracted at the first place the idea of linearity in art but at the same time brought about the subject that was perhaps as if the painter had walked around the subject in 360 degrees and depicted all aspects of it you know when modernists believed in, then comes the dadaism then comes surrealism and then comes other moments until 1960s at the same time let's look at what consists of modernism what comprised of modernism what are the since we are concerned about the culture and especially about the visual arts uh here in this lecture let's look at the cultural foundations of modernism let's look at the key events that occurred that shaped up the idea of modern before we go to the idea of post modernism because these cultural foundations when we see a critique of them happening in the post modern world will be able to understand the difference between or the distinction which is still blurred which is not properly sorted out between the modernism and the post modernism 
So let's have a look at them. A few of them, I'm providing you a list of them, but I will talk, uh, due to the paucity of time, I'll talk about a few of them. The term post-impressionism was coined for a style of art that will be prototype of avant-gardism. Frederick Nietzsche, uh, another German philosopher who announced this idea of Superman in Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Edward Monk's painting, The Cry, foreshadows expressionism, another moment of 20th century art. Sigmund Freud inaugurates psychoanalysis with the interpretation of dreams. Now this is very important that Sigmund Freud, when he talked about the interpretation of dreams, it's a book, it's a wonderful collection of case studies that Freud, a psychoanalyst, the idea of super ego. Man is not only made of conscious world, but it's also about the subconscious and unconscious, two other compartments of our mind that when we encounter an occasion, when we encounter uh, something in life, uh, which we tend to forget, but it remains in our unconscious because we have seen it, so it has reached our, the perception of our, uh, you know, the screens of our perception. So what has happened that it has filled a space in our unconscious, which we do not essentially remember, but it impacts our life considerably. Pablo Picasso's Bureau, uh, Blue Period was another thing that happened during this time. Falls, as we you must have learned about them in the previous uh, lectures, in the previous modules. Uh, the first modernist manifesto, which was uh, written down by Ma Mariniti, uh, Filippo Mariniti of Futurism uh, in Paris. And also, Picasso also produced the first collage, the first collage happened, and uh, Duchamp also painted his last painting in the cubistic style. And what else? There's a range of things that have happened in this era between 1890 to 1949. And the end of modernism is decreed by the South Cuba. Okay, that's it. It's a mission of so let's let's these are the cultural foundations of modernism of course there are many others these are a few to just give you an example of what happened in modernism also uh, just to refer to the idea of speed which was essentially linked to modernism that man could travel on a and a rapid speed from point a to point b it was also it was only made possible because of the modernistic technological advances and scientific inventions, the steam engine and etc., the uh, first flight that took off, the Wright brothers, and other things that were happening at the same time, so on and so forth. But modernism is also about time, that, you know, time, the theories of time, about the idea of traveling from one sector to another. Also, modernism is about exploring the other part of the world, that Europe had a uh, uh, you know, uh, European travelers uh, started traveling because you know, travel was made possible. So the uh, travel was made possible, and artists started looking for subject matters apart from what was available to them in European societies. That's why you see uh, Paul Gauguin uh, going to Tahiti, the island, for his subject matter. So it was also about locating something which is which is which is very different from what has been uh, you know looked upon until then. So we had a snapshot of what modernism was all about. And as I said, this was not a coherent one. So what are we going to look at now is the postmodernism. In order to arrive at a definition, a convincing one, let's first go into the distinctions of modernism and postmodernism, or what gave rise to the postmodernism. Let's, for the sake of simplicity, refer to American literary critic Ihab Hassan's distinction between the post and the modern. Let's, for the sake of simplicity, go straight to the distinction made available to us by the American literary critic Ihab Hassan. He separates modernism and postmodernism in two ways and places ideas that were there in the modernism in contrast with the ideas that were propagated by the postmodernism. So for the sake of simplicity, I'm providing a table of ideas to you and like previously, 
I will define and I will try to discuss with you a few of them so that to give you a sense of what postmodernism was all about in context with modernism. So what was Romanticism about? Romanticism, romanticism, a movement in 19th century of which individual arts, you can refer to the works of Goya, was concerned about the tragedy, about, was concerned about looking out of the window of the artist studio and trying to figure out what is up in the society, what's happening with the common people. It was the time when the French Revolution was taking place. It was also the time when a lot of migrants, when a lot of people got displaced from Spain. It was also the turbulent time when a lot of killings took place. It was also about, <coughs> it was a time also when industrial revolution was shaping up in Europe. Man was encountering for the first time, the idea of speed, as I said, is attached to models. But what was that? Was what was it that was different in postmodernism? How did the idea of romanticism became radically different in postmodernism? Romanticism was about form, about the nature of the form. Postmodernism was about empty form. It was about Dadaism. If we refer, say for example, which again I said that it is uh, the modernism and postmodernism, the boundaries of these two movements or these two concepts or these two ideas are so blurred that you have to go back and forth to trace and to check the hollowness of the idea whether this is modernism and to check as Nietzsche would call it with a, with a hammer to test the hollowness of the statues. So here, modernism is essentially talking about the form. They're concentrating on the form. Picasso is concentrating on the form. It talks about conjective closed, the closed idea of a form, the confines of form, where, as well as the postmodernism talks about empty form. But there's something outside this form that needs to be taken into account, that needs to be looked upon at, and that is also disjunctive that it's not absolute it has been a construct it's not absolute something that cannot be touched another thing that modernism looks at is the purpose of the thing that if a text is written it should serve a purpose if a theater is done if a, if a theatrical play is done it should serve a purpose if an art is, uh, artwork is created, it should serve a purpose. First thing is it should talk to the society, then it should speak with the viewer, and also it should have a certain purpose so that it's not in vain, it's not just lying there. It should have an essential purpose. But what is postmodern about? They're saying no, form can be purposeless. Also, it is purpose is not essential factor of a form or purpose is not about it. Okay, forget it. So what postmodernism is looking at is the purpose. Here what everything must have a purpose. You and me, a text, a painting, a work of art, a film, anything that that is under the sky should have a purpose. Postmodernism is rejecting this idea and saying that it's about play. Play in the sense that every should, everything should be playful. That's when you talk about the idea of performance art in postmodernism, which I will come to a little later. It's about play, it's about the dialogue between the viewer and the viewed. It's not about looking at a, uh, at, a, at a wall and seeing a painting for two or three minutes. It's about engaging with the work of art. Another thing is design, a properly structured design. Today, you are arriving at a design with a proper structure. To build a proper structure, you need a basic structure in place that defines what a structure is, which means you have formulas in place which define that your, your purpose, your, 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 your design should look like this. But postmodernism rejects it. They say no, it should be a chance. It can be a chance also. It's not rejecting immediately the idea of design. But it's saying that it could be arrived at by an, via an accident. It could be a chance. 
it could be an encounter so there's a playfulness in it why to restrict it to the confines of a particular geometric construction again distance modernism talks about distance so let's contextualize it in terms of the visual art so what visual art is what is a painting it's a it, it's an expression that has been laid down on the canvas by its creator and what purpose does it serve it is viewed by the viewer in a museum or a gallery space so there's a distance between the two there's a distance between you and me there's a distance between the high and the low the popular and the classical there's a distance between the viewer and the painting but again when postmodernism rejects this idea it proposes a new idea to replace this one so it talks about participation that now the viewer can participate in an artwork the viewer can also become a part of the artwork by engaging not only with the artwork but with the creator as well so that's why there are instances in postmodernism where people have star you know people where bit with their artists uh, uh, created works of art where the public itself became the insider here the dichotomy in modernism of the insider and the outsider prevails but in postmodernism it blurs it completely blurs so i will come to the idea of performance art uh, here that when performance art immediately after the world war second when it comes into being we'll also talk about this in the conceptual art module after this that when it comes to the being it essentially speaks about the participation it essentially speaks about the gulf that has been created by the modernist art or by the art of the world since centuries that a viewer should be an outsider it has to be essentially an outsider it can't be an insider at all because once he becomes an insider then he has the right to claim the work he can not be his job is fixed he has to remain outside the confines of the work only the artist is the insider and nobody else but here performance art says no artist is not the only insider it's the viewer who is completing the work as well and in a participatory mode not merely looking at the work of art from an external perspective then forging interpretations in his mind instead he is very much the insider who is coming in and equally participating with the artist in the creating of a work of art that's how you see marina abramovich when we talk about conceptual art will come to this in much detail that it talks about ideas here the postmodernism is liberating the history of art it's the entry history of art here the postmodernism is talking about gender for the first time when we say uh, an uh, an essay written by linda knockling questioning the art history that why there has been why there have been no great women artists in the history of art in 1970s when postmodernism was uh, prevalent when it was in vogue when it was in full bloom she asked the question where does the women exist in the history of art have they ever existed there why are there only masculine figures in art why are there a from a to z the series of if you see the book series of a to z it is from an artist who's you know from a to z whatever and whichever name fall uh, between these alphabets they are all male not a single artist there is a female artist so here is the claim about the gender that no no we require we demand we claim so women also claimed their space in the history they reclaimed recovered they went back into the history trans traversing the constructs which were especially masculine and tried to recover the undercurrents of it the underpinnings of it the patriarchal problems the problems that have oppressed the voice of the women forever so the postmodernism talks about absence while as the modernism believes in presence that if you are me or you and me are present 
then only something exists. The absence also plays equal role. Say for example, since you are not students of theory, let me borrow an example from French philosopher Jacques Derrida who talks about trace. All of us know what a trace is, that when someone leaves, if he leaves a trace behind. Say for example, if I write something on a blackboard and that I rub it after some time, if the trace remains there, that means thy sense is already there, that it's not or left, it was existent there, it played a role. So it's not all about presence, is not the absolute presence of somebody or something. So what modernism believes is the signified in the language. Postmodern. Modernism believes in signifier. The postmodernism talks about signified. And what it also talks about is the symptom, the desire. When Karl Marx essentially said that man is a machine because the industrial revolution has reduced down the image of the man, merely a part of an apparatus that is functioning for the welfare of rich, postmodernism says that it's not about machine, but man is a desiring machine. So the desire, which is also a lack, synonymous with lack, that when you have something, when you yearn for something that's not there, when you want to become something else, that desire is always there, the part of human tendency. So let's now look at some of the examples in postmodernity, the road makers of postmodernity who helped us in understanding what the postmodernism is all about. Let's come to the conclusionary part of my lecture here. And let's arrive at a point where we can at least understand a few ideas that comprised of postmodernism. A few ideas that are essentially part of the idea of postmodernism. And we will look at some of the key characteristics after which I will give you a brief overview of the artist that you can re review, you can refer to, in order to understand how postmodernism in visual arts looked like. So here are some things, some key characteristics of postmodern visual art. I'm sorry because I can't go beyond this, otherwise postmodernism is a lot, but that will bore you enough. Postmodern artists, especially painters, exhibit a nonchalance in dealing with seemingly incompatible styles, practice an aesthetic pluralism, and combine a number of different styles of art in one work rather than keeping to the purity of form desired by modernism. As you can see, we're talking about the form and the anti-form of postmodernism. Postmodernism also implies a period where several styles coexist rather than the single strand of development implied by modernism. As I said, it's not a linear trajectory. It's the culmination of many ideas together. Postmodern art involves a return of the vernacular, the daily and the local language of the people, which goes against the modernists' attempts to deprecate and disparage mass culture, high and low art mingle freely. As I said before, about the highness and the lower lowness of the art, the high culture and the elite culture, and the middle class culture, then the low culture. Postmodernism takes into account often the cultural, the pop, the local, the indigenous vocabularies of art that are not considered or were not considered by the modern masters as something important. It is a joy in the unconstrained use of colors and shapes. So they use a lot of colors. Say for example, it has a joy in the unconstrained use of colors and shapes along with a wealth of imagination and a feeling for decorative effects. It demonstrates a carelessness towards orthodox aesthetic conformity and a lack of any systematic approach. It celebrates contradiction and has superfluous, superfluous playfulness and a general lack of respect towards any aesthetic convention whatsoever. In postmodern art, the ego is displayed unrestrainedly and demonstratively, sometimes in a narcissistic or exhibitionistic way. 
sometimes radiating a polymorphous eroticism not confined by convention. So here again, postmodernism is anti-narrative. It is not believing in the grand narratives of modernism. It is not at all believing in restraint. It rejects the idea of grand. It takes into account the small of modernism or in loggerheads with the meta narratives of postmodernism. Now, some of the examples that you can look for on internet or in books that comprise of postmodernism that fall essentially under the purview of what is called postmodernism is the artist Barbara Kruger. I spoke at length on feminism about the women's rights, about how artists took on to the history. Barbara Kruger's work, Your Gaze Hits the Side of My Face, is an important work, a turning point in the history of art in the world. You can also look at the sculptures and plastic art, the land art. Rosalind Cruz's postmodern land art is one of the wonderful things. You can also refer to the, what is postmodernism. Still, I haven't yet arrived on a definition, but one could, one could loosely say that postmodernism is anti-history, it's anti-commodity, it's, it's anti-narrative, it's anti-classical, it is anti-aesthetic at the same time. See you next time with the, concept, with the next module on conceptual art. Thank you.